Well, the game formerly and now currently again known as the Civil War is going to continue, and I think that's good news for Duck fans. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is what you want to do, obviously, as an Oregon fan. So like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show, which is coming to you a little bit later than normal. Appreciate your patience with all of that. I got home at 1.30 in the morning, wasn't an ideal time to do a podcast, and I was, you know, shrugging off the grogginess this morning, but we're back at it, and we'll be back on schedule tomorrow with the show. So, according to John John Canzano, Oregon and Oregon State are going to continue the game formally, and now, once again, known as uh, the Civil War, I think that is a good thing for the Ducks. Now, the way that this is going to work logistically is Texas Tech will not be coming to Autzen next year. Oregon will instead go on September 14th to Oregon State as they would have had the rivalry continued in the context of, you know, the Pac-12 or Pac-10, whatever it uh, might have been once upon a time. And then instead of playing Boise State on September 14th, the Ducks will play Boise State on September 7th. And I'm still left wondering whether or not the Hawaii game is going to stay and Oregon will actually play 13 games in 2023. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see how, how that goes. But the reason that this is good news for Duck fans in my view, is I am a traditionalist. If you are not a traditionalist, if you love going to the Big Ten, if you want to leave the old world behind, if you don't care about tradition and rivalries, if you have no friends that are Beaver fans who you enjoy texting with during the game or after the game or before the game or anything like that, then you probably don't care about this as much. I am not one of those people. I am somebody who laments all of the foundational and widespread change in college football. I don't think that it's great for the sport. It was not needed, is not needed, is going to happen anyway. And I understand that. I understand why. But every opportunity that we have to preserve the regionality and tradition of college football, I think we should. Because that element of the sport that I love so much and is my favorite one to watch on television, it's being ripped away. It's it, The fabric of it is being torn at. We may never play Utah again. It's a weird thing to think about, right? We might never play Stanford again. Imagine saying that back when, you know, Christian McCaffrey was there or Andrew Locke in the early 2010s. Imagine saying, hey, one day these teams are just never going to play again. At least not in a planned environment. Like, huh, what? What? Why, why wouldn't we do it? Well, yeah, well, a lot of reasons as, as to why. But that is the primary reason that I think this is good news for Duck fans. Now, those on the other side of the argument will say something to the effect of, why would we give up a home game? Why would we play the Beavs? There's you know, no upside to the game. There's only downside. I, I don't fully agree with that, by the way. I understand that the upside for Oregon State is greater than it is for Oregon as the Ducks go into the Big Ten and the Beavs get left behind to essentially, at least for a year, be independents in college football. I completely understand that particular argument. However, when you are structuring a non-conference schedule in a world in which it's a 12-team playoff, which we're talking about later in the show, and you want to put together the best schedule that you can, how do you know that Oregon State isn't going to be viewed as a quality win? You can theorize right now about what their roster could be, how good they're going to be, and everything like that. But do you know for certain? Because what I know is that they have been a really good team for the last few years. And another thing I know is that going forward, if they continue spending at the level that they claim they are going to, both Oregon State and Washington State, they will be de facto power five teams, maybe viewed as slightly below. Okay, so it's equivalent to playing a Boise State, essentially? When Boise State is actually good, because when I look at Oregon State's schedule and next year, it looks like it'll be, you know, four power four teams, including Oregon. They'll have Washington State, an FCS game, and they'll play six games against the Mountain West. That's what Oregon State's 2024 schedule is going to be. 
does it seem out of the realm of possibility, barring what happens in the offseason, right? That 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 100% comes into play. Does it feel completely ridiculous to suggest that Oregon State could be a 9 and 3, 10 and 2 team with that particular schedule with a couple power four wins and a couple power four losses and a bunch of wins against the Mountain West? Ranked inside the top 25, does that does that seem absolutely patently absurd? Because to me, it does not. And any opportunity you get to schedule a quality team, I am in favor of. I think Oregon State can be a quality team. No, it won't be viewed the same as when they came to Eugene this year, where they were the number 16 team in the country. They were number 11 the week prior. It could be hard for them to get to that sort of level. But when Oregon and Oregon State play on September 14th, as it looks like they are going to, next year do you think that oregon state could be a top 25 team do you think they could be a top 25 team by the time the season comes to a close because i know that everyone is enamored with this idea of the college football playoff expanding to 12 teams i am not personally but that's just me which again we'll get to later in the show because even in the context of this year i'm not a fan but does it seem ridiculous to suggest that that could be looked upon as a quality win to bolster a resume? Because that's what it's going to come down to. I, I, I got news for all of us as Duck fans. Capable of winning the Big Ten, Oregon absolutely is. Why did that come out like Yoda? I don't really know. But Oregon is capable of winning the Big Ten. How often do you think that's going to take place? Need I remind you, Washington's going to be there. USC is going to be there. I don't think they'll be seven and five every single season. Ohio State and Michigan are already there. Penn State is there. Do you think Oregon is winning that conference? What once every five years? I, I mean, look at look at what Oregon has done in the Pac-12. Won the conference four times, more than anybody else. That was over a twelve-year run. Twelve, thirteen. I think there were thirteen conference championship games. Because we had 11. Yeah. So there were 13 conference championship games. Oregon won four of them in a conference that did not have as much high end quality or as many high end quality teams as the Big Ten is about to have. Even if Oregon continues recruiting and playing at a high level, which I fully expect them to, year in and year out with Dan Lanning at the helm, I believe in that guy. Do, do you think that the rate at which you're going to win the Big Ten and get an automatic berth? to the college football playoff is suddenly going to increase because I don't see that happening. The league is too darn good. So now you're looking at an at-large spot, which comes down to resume, strength of schedule, quality wins, top 25 wins. So when you factor that component into the traditionalist in me, which is you know most of me, to be honest, wanting to continue playing the Civil War against Oregon State, yeah, I think this is a good thing for the Ducks. Now, I've seen some Oregon fans not happy about, well, the Ducks gave away a home game. Okay. And there, <laughs> there are going to be plenty of home games. Like, I, I understand that, you know, not playing Texas Tech at home, that's not not as great. I'm, I'm not really clear as to and, – and, and by the way, I don't know if we know whether or not Boise State is – coming to Onsen or whether or not the Ducks are going to Boise. But regardless, you know, from a revenue standpoint, Oregon's okay. Now, if you're frustrated, like, wow, I wanted to go watch Texas Tech play at Autzen Stadium. Okay, that like that's a valid point of frustration. I tell you, there are a lot of other games that you're going to be able to go to at, at Autzen next year. So I, I don't think that that's going to be too, too big of a concern there. So that's how I feel about it. But as always, let me know in the YouTube comments or the better way is Twitter right now. At Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks, DMs and mentions always wide open over there. Twitter or YouTube comments have been weird lately. They're not showing notifications. So I, I, I'm still trying to go through them and read every comment that I can. But just know that they're being kind of funky. So if you want to be sure that you get a question that you want answered on the show, uh, hit me up on Twitter and, and that'll be a 100% success rate over there. So. You'll also have a 100% success rate when you check out Jace Medical and find what you're looking for. Because I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life. But can, can we talk a minute about preparing for real life? Because it's a thing that you know continues to go along. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. Which, 
is not exactly an ideal proposition. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than being sick and not being able to get the medication that I need. And you don't want to think about that either. But thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case provides a pack of five different antibiotics that treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This sort of stuff can happen to any of us. So visit jacemedical.com, complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com, use offer code locked on, get $20 off your order. That's jacemedical.com. Use that offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. Let's get back into it, shall we? By the way, a couple, couple of just housekeeping items here. If you want to become a Locked on Ducks insider, you can do so at joinsubtext.com slash Locked on Ducks. Link in the description below wherever you listen to or watch the show. You can talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, get my reaction to breaking news and analysis as I see and react to it in real time, and you get priority mailbag access as well. And that is an even more surefire way, even than Twitter. Yeah, that's right. Even more so than Twitter to make sure you get a question answered here on the show. But certainly not a requirement. Free 14-day trial. Then it's just $5 a month, but appreciate all of you over there. Uh, last thing before we get back into it here. Five-star offensive tackle Jordan Seaton, who has been tied to Oregon on more than a couple occasions. He commits on Thursday. Something to watch out for as the Ducks uh, currently have the seventh-ranked recruiting class after the uh, decommitment of Michael Van Buren, not Martin Van Buren. Um, so that's where things kind of sit housekeeping wise. Let's get to that mailbag though. This from JT. Aloha, Mr. McLaughlin. Send it in from Hawaii, I presume. I love it. Locked on Ducks International Podcast. I like how that sounds, everybody. Like how that sounds quite a bit. New to your Locked on Ducks podcast. Been paying attention over the past quarter of the season. Today noticed you stated you aren't a fan of the 12 team playoff. Love to hear your thoughts. Can you direct me to that episode? Keep up the good work. This is the episode. This is it. It's right here. Here we go. So some every dares have heard these thoughts before, but I think the context changes when you look at the way Oregon performed this season. So my opposition to the 12 team college football playoff does not come from me being an Oregon football fan. There is no doubt. Over the last 15 years, Oregon would have had opportunities to play in a structure that could lead, if you won a bunch of games, to a national championship had there been a 12-team playoff. Had there been a 14-team playoff in 2012, Oregon probably goes. Had there been a 12-team playoff in 2011, Oregon goes. Had there been a 12-team in 2013, Oregon probably goes. 2015, maybe not. If Vernon Adams stays healthy, they make the four-team anyway, but you see where I'm going with this. And the 12 team would have applied this year as well. Oregon 100% would have been in. The auto bids would be uh, Michigan, Washington, Alabama, and Texas. They would have the four buys. The uh, highest ranked G5, Liberty, would be in. Gross. Um, sorry, like no disrespect to Liberty. Not trying to give them bullets and board material here. I I'm just saying, like, from a college football fan standpoint, Liberty playing a hilariously weak schedule and winning all their games. They should be rewarded for that. You know, like an opportunity to play in a game against a team from a power conference. They are not deserving of playing for a national championship. That is not the sort of schedule that they played. Liberty would be in. Those would be your five highest ranked conference champions. The other seven teams would be uh, Oregon, Ohio State, Missouri, I think Ole Miss would probably be in there. And I don't remember who the fifth, sixth, and seventh teams would be. But my imposition comes from me being a college football fan my entire life and loving this sport above all else. I think it is the greatest sport in the world. It is the most unique sport in the world. Football is the great American sport. The television numbers reflect that. I love baseball. I got, I got a Mariners shirt on today, okay? I love baseball. Football is the American sport. It is unique to us. We do it better than anybody else. And college football is the best. And college football has always been the best because the way that the sport is structured sets up a unique viewing experience compared to literally anything else, including the NFL. And that's that on a week-to-week -week basis, there is no urgency like that which exists 
in a college football game. There is no sport in the world, and certainly not domestically. I don't really know about Premier League soccer, but they can lose multiple times and still be okay. There is no other sport in which a loss is more punitive than college football, which is why you have to watch every single week, which is why you have to win every single week that you can. There are going to be teams in the NFL that make the playoffs with six, seven, eight, or nine losses even. That is disgusting to me as a sports fan because the regular season in college football has always been what has made it great is that it is about one week at a time. And it's essentially a 14-week playoff. 12 regular season games, conference championship games, 13-week playoff. That's what it's essentially always been, a 13-week double elimination playoff. And so that's why I love the sport so much. And even though Oregon would benefit, I don't think the fundamentals of winning a national championship change. I, I, I don't think that there's a team, maybe this one you could argue is the exception, that could win a national championship that doesn't get a chance to. If you're actually a team that is good enough to win the national championship, or is deserving to win that national championship, you're going to be able to get into the playoff. I have never, not a single solitary time. Washington's better than Oregon this year. That's the way it is. I have never once seen a four-team playoff and thought, gosh, if only they let in the number nine team in the country. The teams that are the best separate themselves every time. And what I lament losing even though it can benefit Oregon, which I fully admit there is an easier path to the playoff because Oregon will be able to lose a couple games and still have a chance to get in, and they won't have to win a conference championship to get in, which some people see as good. I personally do not because now the value of a loss and therefore the value of an ind individual game is significantly reduced. And it is basic economics that can tell you that this is a reality, even for people who advocate for expanding the playoff. You cannot increase the supply of something without dropping the price. The price. That's the way it goes. I took Econ 101. Many of you did as well. Supply and demand looks like this. It forms an X. And depending on, I don't know which side, I don't know which arm I should drop down for everybody here on YouTube. You increase supply, you drop the price. It goes down. The price or the value of something is reduced when you increase the supply. And that applies to college football. So, for example, Oregon losing to Washington, that was a de facto play in game. Michigan against Ohio State was a de facto play in game. We already have that structure in college football, but we're choosing to get rid of it because of money. And so, as a result, Michigan, Ohio State, who cares? Seriously outside of the teams playing in that game that want to win because it's a rivalry, who cares? You were watching the Iron Bowl. You know why? Because Bama was trying to get into the playoff and they couldn't lose another game. I was watching the game. And so were you against Ohio, between Ohio State and Michigan because you knew that the loser was not going to make the playoff. Now, what's the matter? Yeah, sure, you can still watch it and enjoy the football game, but the stakes are not the same, not even close. So that's why, even though Oregon unquestionably benefits, especially going into the Big Ten from an expanded playoff, I would have rather, and, and the expanded playoff as well, ties in to conference realignment because it is removing the regionality and the importance of that, right? It is your, it, it, when you're going into a conference, I think you can pretty easily make the case that it is too restrictive of a playoff at four teams when you have these mega conferences that are insanely loaded. But that's not what I wanted for the sport. That's not what I want for the sport. That's just what we're getting in the sport. And I have to adapt to that. And I got to put up with change and I don't care for it very much, but that's the way it is. So that's the nature of my opposition. And even though Oregon felt that way, like, yeah, it would have stunk to lose to, to lose to Washington again. But guess what? In the NFL, you can lose two games in the regular season to your rival, but it doesn't matter as long as you get a run and maybe beat them in the playoffs. Like everything was on the line for that Oregon-Washington game. It sucked to lose. You know why? Because the stakes were massively high. 
but you can't have the stakes be that high when you're just going to get into the playoff anyway. So that's, that's, that's why I don't care for it, but great question. Boy, I think I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but such is the nature of uh, this show. Appreciate you all being subscribed. Still plenty more to get to still plenty. You need to get to on FanDuel because as the weather gets colder, which it definitely is no matter where you are, the NFL offers, they stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That could include Oregon against Liberty in the Fiesta Bowl. By the way, Ducks are a big, fat favorite, even more so than against Washington with Bo Nix playing. I think they will win. That's $150 if Oregon wins. Or you can bet on that game. You can bet on any other game where you think one side is coming out on top. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app, super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Okay, a couple more mailbag questions. Then we'll get out of here and we'll be back. We'll be back at a regular time tomorrow, if you're not. This question from the camel, like the straw that broke the camel's back. Are you that camel in that particular? Mm, what is that a straw that broke the camel's back? Is that a proverb? I don't know. Anyway, uh, what is your thought on the Ducks bowl matchup? And because of our opponent, any limitations on being able to climb in post bowl rankings? Even if you owe boat races Liberty, prospects seem unlikely we can jump anyone ahead of us who loses thoughts. Well, clearly records matter above all else. So if Ohio State loses their bowl game to Missouri, no way that the Ducks wouldn't jump ahead of them. And I believe Oregon is currently in the college football playoff rankings ahead of Missouri. Now, let me double check that just to be certain. The Ducks are at 11 and 2. Missouri's 10 and 2. Ohio State's 11 and 1. Uh, Georgia is going to boat race Florida State. And I'm going to dunk on the people who were mad at Florida State not getting into the playoff. But until that happens, I don't know that the Ducks would move ahead of you know, Georgia or Florida State in that instance. Well, Florida State, actually, I think they probably could. Um, but I think the important thing for the Ducks, and yeah, it's not the sort of importance we were hoping for at this point in the season. I, I recognize and understand that. However, I think what you're looking for is dominate Liberty in the bowl game and carry a top 10 ranking in the next year. You, you want to carry all the momentum that you can into the offseason. Putting up a 12-win year which would be a great accomplishment for Dan Lanning in year two. And, and you want to have as much hype and confidence in the program going forward as you can. This is a sport where, per, where perception matters a great deal. And you want to be viewed as a program that is on the upward trajectory. And Oregon's already in that discussion with a 10-win season last year, an 11-win season this year, that's a pretty high standard to set, by the way, of saying, like, you know, well, how much further up can you go? Well, we know how much further. It's just a matter of whether or not Dan Lennon will get the guys there. I think eventually he can, just a matter of when. So when you look at what Oregon is trying to accomplish here, yeah, a big dominating win would keep him in the top 10. I think it would make him potentially a preseason top 10 team next year. And again, even in the 12-team playoff, there are seven at-large spots that are going to be available. Seven. I'd rather start as a higher ranked team than as a lower ranked team. And that's the next goal for the Ducks is get back to the playoff there uh, in the 12 team era. So, you know, I, I think that they can absolutely climb. You know, if Ohio State loses, if Florida State loses handily, Oregon could go up and, you know, maybe be inside the top six. But I think anything inside the top 10 is kind of where Oregon would like to be, kind of like in the recruiting world. They like to be inside the top 10. Last one here. This is about the transfer portal. This is a good question. This is from John. How many, what percentage of the players entering the portal are doing so after being encouraged by duck coaches to do so? What's your read on that? So this is definitely a read. You know, I, I've talked to people about this before and, you know, heard like, oh, so-and-so kind of got forced out or so-and-so was uh, not playing or anything like that. I think a lot of times transfer portal departures are not a mutual parting of ways per se, because Oregon can't actually initiate a move, you know, formally to say, hey, 
um, we don't want you here and we want your scholarship spot. What they can do is go to a kid and say, your best interests are going to be served elsewhere. That's where you'll be able to get more playing time. And then the kid's saying, okay, I'll transfer. And then he frees up a scholarship spot. So the most common transfer portal instance is one like a Chris Hudson, a Brian Addison, a Triquez Bridges, a guy who, you know, might have been on the roster the year prior. Maybe he wasn't, but his playing time went down and he did not feel that there was a great potential for his playing time to increase going forward. And so he decides, OK, I want to go somewhere where I'm going to be able to play and maximize my potential. And I think that's the right move for a guy like Triquez or Chris Hudson there. So. I think that for for guys like that, it's the most common occurrence. There are definitely instances in which a stat, but but I think they're pretty, I think they're pretty select where it's a one-sided, the coaching staff going to a kid and just saying outright, you're not good enough. We'd like you to leave. I'm not denying it happens. You'll never get a straight answer from anybody as to how often. My read on that situation, it's pretty rare. I, I think that the playing time is the message that the coaches send. I don't think there are a lot of kids that are saying, no, I want to stay at Oregon no matter what. And the coaching staff saying, we don't want you here, go leave. I, I think the message comes through in the sense of, we don't see a path for you becoming a starter. You're going to be a rotation guy. We're happy to have you. But if you want to seek opportunities elsewhere, that's all good and fine. But it's definitely back to portal season and, and managing You know what, uh, what, what what the needs are and everything, which is something I'm going to talk about on, on tomorrow's show for sure. So make sure you tune into that, which again, will be at the regularly scheduled time. And I, I think that for most kids, it's a decision that the kid is making because of the playing time from the coaches. I'm sure there are some instances in which the coaches go, boy, I didn't think that you were going to be one of the guys leaving. I think that's a more common occurrence than the coaches saying, we want you to leave even if you want to stay. So I, I, I think that's kind of where, where things fall. And, and just remember, Oregon's had a handful of players go in the portal. No big names so far just yet. And we're still waiting to see what Dylan Gabriel does. So appreciate everyone listening. We'll leave it right there. See you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.